Hello, everybody. Welcome to When Harry Met Board Games. Once again, it's me, Harry, and I'm here going through my top 50 games of all time. As I explained in the last video, I chose the number 50 because I still consider myself a relatively new gamer. I haven't played a ton of games. I'm talking about from maybe about 225 games or so. I'm selecting my 50 favorite of all time. And I also felt that that was a number where I felt excited to talk about my games. I felt very comfortable talking about my games and sharing them on this platform. Once I went too far beyond the number 50, I started feeling less secure about my games. So I definitely didn't want to go down too far and dilute my, my list. So I chose 50 as a good round solid number. Last time I went through my numbers 50 through 41 and today I'll be going through my numbers 40 through 31. So these games should be better than the previous 10. Definitely in my opinion they are better. So let's begin. First we'll start with my number 40 game of all time which is Thunderstone Quest. Thunderstone Quest. This is a deck building game with a fantasy theme. This is the third edition of this gaming system. It first came out about 10 years ago as just Thunderstone and each iteration has added different elements, different mechanisms. This edition, the third edition, Thunderstone Quest, has added a spatial element where you have two different places you physically move your miniature through, the market or the village, which includes the market, and the dungeon, which has all the monsters that you fight. And it kind of has a dungeon dell, dungeon crawl kind of feel with it combined with the central um, deck building mechanism, which I must confess, I am a huge fan of the deck building mechanism. I really like it. Games tend to get a little bit more uh, credit from me when they do have a deck building mechanism or some type of deck construction element to them. So Thunderstone, Thunderstone Quest definitely has that. Now this is a game that prior to making my list, I had only played it a few times. And even so, it was enough to bring it up all the way to number 40. I will say that I have played it a few more times since making the list, and I am very sure that this game is going to climb up the ranks by the next time I do a top uh, 50 or whatever number I choose to do next time. So if you're interested in deck building, if you like fantasy themes, if you like dungeon crawls, but are curious about experimenting with a more abstracted way of going through a dungeon and appreciate hand management and deck building, I think this is a good game to try at the very least, if not buy. And that is my number 40 game of all time, Thunderstone Quest. And now we'll move on. Oh, by the way, let me just share a little bit of information. The designer of this game is Mike Elliott and the publisher is AEG. With that being said, we move on to number 39, my 39 favorite game of all time. And that is Tikal. And this game is designed by a group of designers, or I should say a, a duo of designers, which is Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer. And it's published, or at least this first edition is published by Rio Grand Games. And TCAL is a area control, area majority type of game with an, uh, an archeological exploration type theme. So you're a group of, of archaeologists or a group of explorers on an expedition and you are going through the jungles of Tikal and you are discovering temples and discovering treasures and the players who have the majority in the different areas score certain points for that. The players who have recovered treasures score points according to the treasures that they've recovered, the different types of treasures. So it has a set collection aspect to it as well. And those are two mechanisms that I really appreciate in games. Area control slash majority and uh, set collection are both 
mechanisms that I tend to like in a game. And I feel that, you know, Kramer and Kiesling, they combine these games, they combine these mechanisms very well, and they work. This is another game, I've only played it a few times. Um, I've played it a few times. It, I think it's best at three, as three or more, as all area control games are. You know, I mean, area control with two can be okay. It can it, it can be functional, but not necessarily optimal. And that's the same thing I would say with this game. So it doesn't get to the table as much as I would like because yes, I need a group of three, preferably four, to play this game. But even at a two-player count, I feel that it works okay. It works better than some other area control, area majority games that I might like in a vacuum even more than I like Tikal, but I see their flaws in a two-player version much more than I see in this game. So if you like the feel of exploration, seeing what's what's next, what's the next tile that you're going to draw, and is, is there a volcano there? Is there a treasure to be discovered? Is there just empty land or is there a temple to excavate? And you like the mechanisms, they, they sound interesting to you, um, um, area majority, set collection. This is a good game to try out. And for me, I'm enjoying it. I like it. And it's my number 39 game of all time, Tikal. Now we move on to my number 38 game of all time. And this is a classic in the industry. And it's Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico designed by Andreas Safar and published by Rio Grande Games. Once again, Rio Grande Games has a lot of games uh, in my collection. This game is from 2002, and for many years, it was the number one ranked game on BoardGameGeek.com, which is the largest online database website uh, about board games on the entire World Wide Web, in all the internet, this is the number one site. You could say it's the number one authority, so to speak. Um, and for many, many years, the fan-based ranking system, or the user-based ranking system, had Puerto Rico as the number one game of all time. And it's still ranked pretty highly, if I'm not mistaken. It's ranked maybe 25 to 30 range right now, of a, a game that's nearly 20 years old, in an industry that's really much about cult of the new, what's the next big thing. And out of, you know, hundreds of thousands of entries in this database, to be ranked in the top 30 is an incredible feat. And now let me tell you a little about the game. So this game, it's about action selection. So each player takes turns choosing the action that all players will uh, activate or participate in for that turn. However, the person choosing that action or that role will get a, a bonus that distinguishes him or benefits him slightly more than his opponents. So the tension in this game is choosing the right action at the right time because yes, you might be desperately craving a particular action, but you know that on that particular turn, it would benefit the next person over or one of your other opponents more than you. So it's not the right time perhaps to choose it. However, if you don't choose it, you might regret it because again, you might just be starving for whatever resource or whatever benefit that action gives you. It's a really tight and intricate system of when do I do what, who should do what, what, who is going to do what after me, right? What's the next player going to do? And hopefully the player before me doesn't choose what I want to choose for myself. And hopefully they don't choose what I'm fearing they might choose because that might impact, you know, my choice of where I'm trying to go, what direction I'm trying to go in this round for this game. And you're doing this all to collect and produce certain uh, resources and build buildings in the city of San Juan and ship these resources or these goods back to the motherland for victory points. And whoever has the most victory points collectively from their shipping and from their buildings that they have built and that give them different powers and different abilities, whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. It's a fun game. It has an interesting two-player variant, which my wife and I play a lot. This is my wife's, one of my wife's favorite games. She likes it a lot. And she, for the most part, has played it just two players, and she still likes it. And I, I do feel that a two-player variant works. I believe 
some editions or maybe some of the newer editions of Puerto Rico actually come with a two the two player variant included in the rules but this game definitely plays better with higher player counts because you have more ships available you have more buildings available and you also have more roles to choose from and it makes the decision of which role is going to be played you know much more challenging and i also don't think it affects the the game length too much by having additional people because again the engine building in this game is done much quicker and maybe engine building is not the the right term but the point is things flow much quicker because you're picking more roles to play with so a lot of the different roles are getting incorporated and a lot of stuff is happening on each turn so game length isn't necessarily affected too much by having higher player player counts but this game is a classic it's a good game my only knock on this game honestly speaking is that the components are just are just bad you know and functionally speaking I haven't come up, at least I haven't come up, maybe I should look into a research online, group think. I haven't come up with a proper way to, to you know, trick this game up, to bling it out, to make it look nice. Um, it's just, it's just a, a bad looking game. I think there's deluxe editions and anniversary editions um, that look a little bit better, but the starting point is so low that... <laughs> You know, as a result, the ceiling is low as well. But if you can get past ugly looking components, it's a good game. It's a game that till this day doesn't really have too many, you know, rivals in that area. And, um, and, it, and it does it well. So that is my number 38 game of all time, Puerto Rico. Now we move on to my number 37 game of all time. And that is... Lord of the Rings, the cooperative game. This is designed by Reiner Knizia back in the year 2000 and published by Fantasy Flight Games. This is a old classic co-op game. I believe it's the first ever, you know, cooperative game made for adults that was published um, in the gaming industry. And this game... It is, first of all, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. I enjoy the Lord of the Rings uni universe. I enjoy the Lord of the Rings characters, the Lord of the Rings um, lore. These are things that I like. While Reiner Knizia is known to be a more abstracted game designer, where his gaming mechanisms and his themes don't necessarily mesh or tie in. They're just like two independent entities, you know, working towards the common goal of, making you like the game but i if you like the theme of, of lord of the rings you'll still appreciate some of the characters you have here the special abilities that each character has because each player has to choose a starting character you'll appreciate the tension that the game simulates not necessarily through the use of the mechanisms in this game but just by the progression of what is happening on the board, it kind of simulates some of the tension that you encounter when you read the books or watch the movie. I believe this is more based on the books than the movies. This was actually published, I think, before the first movie ever came out in theaters. So this game is an interesting game. It's a cooperative game with lots of opportunities for tough decisions, for sacrificial you know, putting the other player first, taking the hit for the team kind of thing. And it is really, really hard. Um, it took me a while to win it for the first time. And I think I've only won it one time. So uh, my wife and I have played it. She's not as big of a fan as I am because of our low success rate. But I like this game. The mechanisms, the puzzle in it are tight. They are stimulating. They're challenging. They're intriguing. And it creates this great team building exercise for you and your teammates because again you need to exercise that selflessness that willingness to put someone else first at your own detriment because you know that it'll be for the greater good of the team um, one player at all times is going to be the ring bearer but it's not always going to be the same player so absolutely the ring bearer's safety and well-being is uh, takes priority over the well-being of all other all other players and you have Sauron working his way down a track 
to try to catch up with you guys and ultimately defeat you. Again, it creates for really tense uh, situations, really um, tough decision-making opportunities, circumstances that just force you to do something that you may or may not want to do. You might have to get rid of cards that you really, really wanted to hold on to, or you might have to take um, you know, a hit in the corruption track you know, just to prevent something that might be even worse. It has a little bit of luck with a, a little bit of dice rolling occasionally through the game, but for the most part, it's very deterministic and you choose what you, the decisions you do, you, you're going to make at the end of each turn. However, you are flipping a tile, a random tile at, at the beginning of your turn, which determines what happens to you and your opponents. Do you guys advance on a certain track on the board because there's multiple tracks on the board or do you have to advance in the event track which triggers for the most part bad events that hurt you and the other players and that aspect of the game is also luck but it's manageable luck because you have a certain amount of tiles and you have a good idea of the probability of what's going to come out and based on that you determine your pace on how, how fast you're trying to get through each of these different adventures that make up the game i'm probably making it sound more um exciting and thematic than what it is and again it's it's not a very thematic game it's a dr reiner knizia design but i feel like if you enjoy lord of the rings um, and enjoy cooperative games you have a chance of seeing the theme the little inkling of theme that the game might have and appreciating it and you can very likely appreciate the core mechanisms that make the game. Um, so that is my number 37 game of all time, Lord of the Rings. Now we move on to my number 36 game of all time, and that is Runebound. And this is the third edition of Runebound designed by Lucas Litzinger. And or Lit Singer, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And it's published by Fantasy Flight Games. This game or this gaming system has had three iterations. This is the third edition. I believe the first two editions came very close upon one another. Um, they followed each other back to back. And I believe the first two were designed by Martin, Martin Lawrence, so who's known for European style games or Euro style games, which are more. Um, abstracted, a little bit less thematic, and tend to be less conflict-oriented. Um, however, he designed this base system of Runebound, which is an adventure fantasy game where you go out and you fight monsters and you fight the evil, you know, masterminds or overlords who are in charge of these monsters eventually at the end of the game. I cannot tell you too much about the, the first and second edition. I've never played it, even though I have interest in playing it because I've heard that... Second edition and third edition are very different to the point where it's possible to like one and not like the other. So Lucas Litzinger here, he took this gaming system and he made it his own. He made the third edition here. And I believe what this edition adds that the second edition doesn't have is the combat mechanism. Here, the combat is resolved by the casting of two-sided two-dimensional tokens and these tokens represent different equipment and or weapons that your heroes are carrying or have acquired throughout the game and when you enter battle you cast these tokens and based on the side that they land on these are the the symbols that you're able to trigger some of them activate combat some or, or attack or or, or damage. Others activate shields that protect you. Others activate magical combat. Others activate doubling the power of another. Others activate the power of being able to recast or make your opponents who are also flipping their or, or casting their own uh, tokens, making your opponent or forcing them to flip over their tokens to the other side that's less advantageous to them. So that's how the combat is resolved in this game. While in the second edition, combat was resolved by dice rolling, your typical fantasy dice chucking type of combat resolution. I am not the biggest fan of that conflict resolution style. However, I don't mind it 
because it's just one game, right? Like, if more people adopted it and started using that or implementing this resolution system into their game, I probably would not be the biggest supporter of that change or that trend. But I like it in this game. It is cool, it is fun, and it leads for some interesting decisions. Um, also, it gives you a better chance of knowing what you're gonna do when you enter combat, right? Because you know that you have these casts and you know that they have only two sides. So there's no one out of six chance of something happening. You know that you have a 50-50 chance of certain things happening. Now, this game has a beautiful board map, which you adventure through and travel through. Not everything you're doing is combating. You're going on different quests to explore different parts of the board and discover different things. You're presented with lots of, you know, social encounters where you're given some sort of challenge or decision that you must pick among two different options, two different choices, and different choices give you different benefits. You have some push your luck elements with skill tests that take place and I, I, I enjoy how skill tests take place. It's not dice rolling, it's flipping of a deck of cards and if a certain symbol comes out, then you have passed that test and you reap whatever benefit that test provides for you. Um, the game is a little bit long. I've only played it with two players. It goes from two to four. There are solo variants. And I believe there's a co-op uh, expansion that adds a, an official solo mode. However, I would never play it with four players. And I very likely will never play it with three players. Because it's definitely one of those games that it's, you know, its length is determined by how many players play the game. So a two-player game is north of two hours you might push the two and a half hour barrier with, with two players. So if you play with three players, you will easily do three hours and maybe even get to the four hour mark. And I don't even want to imagine what it's like with four players. And I'm sure there's a lot of people watching right now or people who who played the game that know that they can play it in a short amount of time. It's been my experience that when I play this game, it's about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes per player. And there's some very tough decisions to be made, and that doesn't help the, the length, but it definitely makes the game interesting. Now, the even though it's a fantasy combat-related game, very seldom, very rarely do the two opponents or the multiple opponents ever really get to fight one another. They do control the tokens of the monsters that they respectively encounter throughout the game, but the two players' characters, their heroes very rarely interact. They can interact in some ways, some trading, maybe even some conflict, but for the most part, they don't They don't interact. For the most part, it's a race to just acquire as much gold, defeat as much monsters, uh, earn enough lore to buy enough equipment and buy enough weapons and, and train for enough skills to make you the most powerful version of yourself so that eventually you can be equipped to defeat the mastermind at the end of the game and quite often it's been my experience that neither one of us defeats the mastermind and we just end up both losing the game so it kind of feels cooperatively in that sense that someone else shares in your failure and in your misfortune but it's a fun game i've played it several times it's it's funny because this is not typically my style of game but this game works for me and I enjoy it a lot and if you like fantasy and if you like beautiful adventure boards to explore this is a good game to experiment with or to try and that's my number 36 game of all time Runebound. Now we will move on to my number 35 game of all time and that is Jamaica and Jamaica is published by a few designers we have Malcolm Braff and we have Sebastian Pauchon. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. I'm not even sure if it's French, but I'm pronouncing it that way. And I, I imagine that it's French because I believe the other designers here are French designers. And finally, the third designer in this game, and I don't know how much involvement he has in the design of this game, but that is Bruno Cathala. And this game is published by Gameworks. Now, Bruno Cathala is a designer that I very much appreciate his philosophy design and his style of games and this game is a fun family weight game by family weight i mean it doesn't boggle you down with 
heavy rules and lots of exceptions to rules and so on and so forth. Um, it is just a pirate themed racing game where you're racing around the island of Jamaica trying to be the first player to make it to Port Royal. But in the meantime, you want to establish your supremacy in, over the seas by getting into battle with your fellow uh, pirates or your opposing pirate ships and using your cannons to attack them and taking and plundering their gold and plundering their food to help you provide for your ship and going to the sea, to the, the, the caves and the lairs that surround the island of Jamaica that have hidden treasure for you to explore and to plunder. And at the same time, some of these you know, caves might also have dreaded curses that hurt you, but you don't know. And it's a push your luck, you know, element with that. The movement in the game is very clever. You roll dice to determine a number for a morning and an evening action. And you have a handful of cards, three at a time. And you're deciding, uh, you know, each, each of these cards has a morning action and an evening action. And you're deciding which card you want to play to benefit on the morning and evening action according to the number rolled for the dice respectively for evening and morning so if you roll a three for your morning action and a four for your evening action and you have a card that lets you move in the morning and get gold in the in the evening you would move forward three spaces on the board and then you would get collect four gold for your evening action and you're trying to manipulate manipulate your way through the board because you want to preferably win this race because the winner of the race is not guaranteed the victory but they are going to get a ton of points for being the first person uh, to make it to Port Royale or for crossing the Port Royale, period. And there's a certain threshold, a certain uh, line you must cross that if you don't even cross that line, you'll have negative points uh, added to your final score. You also want to collect some gold because that also contributes to your end score. You want to discover these, these treasures because they also contribute to your final score. So all these things uh, collectively lead to the end game result that you're trying to accomplish. I've seen people win the race and still not win the game. I've seen people have tons of gold and still not win the game. So it really creates for some tough, challenging decisions along the way. It creates for some cutthroat combat throughout the way. And it also creates some excitement because racing is always a fun concept. It's, it's almost silly when you think about it. Ho, 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 who's going to be the first pirate ship to cross the Port Royale? And it's, it's just exciting as you just anticipate who's going to cross as you start to see people as underdogs who have no chance of winning the race and they end up making a comeback and catching up and surpassing everybody else. It creates for a lot of exciting, fun opportunities when you roll the dice in conflict and you put a bunch of cannons that add to your total dice roll and you think it's nearly impossible for your opponent to defeat you and then they roll the one side on this six-sided combat die that is just an automatic victory. It's not even a number. It's just an automatic victory. And everybody loses it and everybody shouts because no one thought that that other person had a chance of winning that conflict. And then the person who invested all their cannon tokens and lost the battle is just frustrated and wishing that they could take that turn back. Now, I sound like a person who speaks from experience, right? So... This game, again, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of silly fun. It's not very heavy. It's the kind of game you can introduce to lots of people. I'm not saying it's everybody's cup of tea, but mechanically speaking, it's not beyond a person who doesn't have a lot of experience playing board games. And that is my number 35 game of all time, Jamaica. And now we move on to my number 34 game of all time, and that is Hollywood Golden Age. Previous iterations of this game were Trump Fabric, um, what's it called, Hollywood Blockbuster, Dream Factory. This game is designed by, again, Dr. Reiner Knizia, a prolific game designer. And it's published by Ludanova Games, which again is a Spanish, Spain-based publisher. This is a reprint. I am not sure if this is being distributed anywhere in North America. I am 
almost certain it's not. I had to buy my my copy from Europe, and I believe right now it's a uh, it's Ludanova and I think another French distributor that is providing this game in Europe. I'm not too sure. Don't quote me on that. But this is a game that it's again auction bidding, which I tend to feel like that is where Reiner Knizia thrives. And you would think it's like samey because his most successful mechanism, or at least the one that to me it seems to appeal the most to me, which is his auction bidding mechanisms, you would think that his auction bidding games would feel samey. But that is where I have to tip my hat off to Reiner Knizia because he comes up with different and creative ways to implement auction and bidding for each and every game. So in this game, you're going through the city of Hollywood as some kind of movie producer, and you're recruiting directors, and you're recruiting actors, and you're recruiting cameramen, and you're recruiting musicians, and you're, recru you're, you're recruiting um, seamstresses, and diff all different kinds of aspects of the Hollywood industry, the things that you would think you need to make a movie. And you have all these scripts that you're trying to, to produce and you're trying to acquire the necessary staff to accomplish them, to fulfill them. So you're going through the town, you're driving through the town, and players are bidding for these different, um, these different um, characters, actors, directors, and so on and so forth. And when you bid, what's interesting about this game is that when you bid, the losers of the bid distribute evenly distribute the money that the winner just finished bidding amongst themselves so as a player when you're winning a an auction you are helping your opponents become more wealthy and also the reverse is true when you're losing an auction that you really wanted to win you are comforted by the fact that you're also getting some cash out of it and that is the challenge of this game, striking that balance of bidding the right amount. You want to win these auctions at certain points in the board, depending on what your objectives are and what your script is and what you're trying to accomplish. But you also don't want to just give more money to your opponent than what you have to. And at the same time, you are afraid of underbidding and maybe having your opponent increase their bid to a point where you no longer can even throw your name in the hat anymore so to speak so this game really really cool i like the hollywood theme this is called hollywood golden age for a reason the actors here are actors from the 40s they're from the black and white era and uh, you may or may not know some of these folks i mean i know i myself i probably knew a handful of these characters but it's still fun. It's still interesting. It's educational in that sense, and it's just it's just cool to just say, hey, you know, I, I wanna I wanna I wanna create this movie. I wanna create Gone with the Wind or Casablanca, and I just wanna you know get the get the actors that I need. And obviously, these are not the actors that were in the original film. But hey, this is what I have to work with, and this is what I'll make. And you get awards throughout the game for different for for having the the best current film, even if it wasn't the best film you know, produced in that round, if it was produced in a previous round and come round two and come round three, it's still the best film at that point, you get further awards for having the best film. It's actually an interesting mechanism that I've seen other games that may or may not be on my list um, copy and do so effectively. Um, it, it's, it's really cool. You even get an award for having the, the best B movie, which is really just the lowest value movie that at the end of the game you're gonna get a bonus uh 10 points for having that so it even it's even comforting and and and, and consolation to know that this terrible movie that you produced because certain bids didn't go your way still is gonna end up getting you some points at the end of the game it's really it's really creative it's really neat um it's it's it's, it's unique even amongst Reiner Knizia games and again just the feel of the Hollywood producer thing. It does it for me. Um, I appreciate this game a ton. And um, and I and that is why it's ranked at my number 34 game of all time. Hollywood Golden Age. Now we move on to my number 
33 game of all time, and that is Alhambra, or in Spanish, Alhambra, because the H is silent. Alhambra is designed by Dirk Hen and published by Queen Games. This is a former Spiel des Jahres winner from the year 2003. So this is an award-winning game. So anyone who wants to give me a hard time for having it on my list needs to factor that in. I know that it's a little bit old, but this game is a game that I appreciate. This is a game that combines tile um, placement with hand management um, or even resource management because your hand in theory, are your resources. You have a hand of cards that represent money. But what's interesting about this game is that you have four different markets to purchase your tiles from. You don't just draw tiles, you have to purchase them. You have four different markets to purchase your tiles from, and each of those markets are color-coded. And then you have the cards, which are the money in the game. And each of these cards are have different colors that um, correspond with the colors of the different markets, the four different markets. I believe it's blue, blue, orange, green. I, I, I honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember the color of the markets. I remember. I think I was going by the the color of the tiles, which is different than the color of the markets. But the point is, you have these four different colors, and you have the different cards that correspond to these four different markets, the currencies, the different denominations of money that you're using. And throughout the game, you're making decisions to either buy a tile or or take your action, because you only have one action normally in, in the game per turn, or use your action to draft some of the visible money cards that are in this, in this trade market here, right below the, the market to buy the tiles. And... You're trying to have a balanced hand of cards because you want to have cards of all colors because you don't want to be limited in your purchasing options. In the future, a great tile that you want can be on the green market. And if you don't have any green currency, then you're going to have no chance of getting it. So what's interesting about this game is that if you are able to purchase something, um, you don't make change. So you have cards that have different numbers ranging from one through nine. And if you have to overpay for a tile, well then too bad, so sad. However, if you are clever enough or just sometimes lucky enough to be able to pay the exact price that the tile is worth, well, the game rewards you with a bonus action. Because again, typically you just have one action on your turn. The game rewards you with an additional action. And now if you can manipulate your hand, you can manipulate the currency that you're acquiring throughout the game, that you're drafting throughout the game to work in your favor, you can maximize and optimize your turns because instead of having one action, you in theory can have five actions if you're able to purchase all four tiles in the four different markets for exact change and also get a bonus fifth action to draw or draft a currency card now that's very hard and maybe unlikely to happen but i have seen quite often where players are able to have three actions on a turn because they've been clever and be able to buy a couple tiles for the same exact price now the challenging part of this game is that once you acquire these tiles, you don't just place them on ran at random on your tableau. No, instead, you arrange them. And there's a lot of rules as to the placement of these, of these tiles, their adjacency and, and where they can go. And some of these tiles have walls and the walls cut off from this open-ended part of the, of, the, of the building that you're constructing. And this open-ended part, you know... Uh, it is cut off by this wall, so it's not a legal place to place it. And also you score points for your consecutive, your longest consecutive wall on your building. And you also score points by the set collection in this game because you're trying to have the largest sets in the different respective colors of the building tiles that you are acquiring. So certain colored tiles are more valuable and give you more points throughout the game. And certain are less valuable, give you lesser points, but it doesn't hurt to have them in your bag. So, again, this is a really cool game that combines a spatial aspect to it. 
manipulating those tiles, knowing where to place them, not getting yourself stuck, you know, not regretting a prior decision that was made a few turns ago because now you've realized that you put yourself in a hole and you've given yourself less options, kind of having that foresight, that that anticipation of what is to come. And as you play the game more, you obviously figure some of these things out. But again, it's just simple mechanisms that still provide a very deep and rich experience with lots of different ways that the game can go. This game has lots of expansions. I only own one and I still haven't played it yet, but the replayability is there. The ease of play is there. And again, it's just it's just a game that creates for some very unique decision-making options. What do I do? When do I do it? Do I draft these cards? Do I purchase something? Do I draft this card that will help me get the next tile at exact price, but will that st tile still be there waiting for me? Or do I diversify the cards that I draft so that I can make sure that down the line I'm covered in all four markets? Again, I might be over-exaggerating the depth of this game, but it has been good for me and I have enjoyed it and other people that I've played it have had fun with it as well. And that's my number 33, Alhambra. And now we move on to my number 32 game of all time, and that is Mission Red Planet. Again, this is by a duo of game designers, Bruno Cathala, which you have heard mentioned, and Bruno Faduti. And this is published by Fantasy Flight Games. This is actually the second edition of this game. I've never played the first edition, but I've heard that component-wise, it has been an upgrade. Now, this is an area majority, area control game, basically on this planet, the red planet, Mars. And Mars is divided, or this red planet is divided, uh, uh, by different... Um, colonies it's made up of different colonies and you even have its moon and its moon represents a colony in itself and you're trying to have area majority in these different colonies that each produce different types of goods um different types of i guess scientific goods and and also you're choosing to set your send your astronauts into into different um, ships that will eventually launch and get to the colonies that you're trying to get to. And at the end of each scoring round, which this game has 10 rounds, and, um, and in those 10 rounds, there's like three of those are scoring rounds, you increment how much value each of those said colonies has. So as the game progresses, the area majority becomes more and more important, which is something that not all area control games have. Some area control games are very static where you always benefit the same by having the majority in a certain area. But here, you know, incrementally, it, in it increases how valuable these regions are. Now, some of the things that make this game interesting and unique is that it adds the character or role selection aspects of Bruno Faduti's other famous game, Citadels, which is not in my top 50, I will give that disclaimer and that spoiler, but it combines that character selection uh, mechanism, which for people who are not familiar, you have, a, you have a bunch of characters. In the case of this game, it's nine. Unlike Citadels, you, where you have a pool of characters that all the players share and choose from and draft from secretly, here, you're still drafting secretly, but the nine cards are your deck of character cards and your opponent has the identical same nine character cards in their deck and each turn you and your opponents are secretly and simultaneously choosing which character you want to play and then there is a countdown to reveal which characters get played uh first and in what in what order they get played so even that becomes part of the tension of the decision making process because i might want to pick this character because he gives me a really good power that i'm going to benefit from on this turn but at the same time his number tells me that he's going to get called more likely than not later down the road so my opponents might get their actions in before mine so again it creates that that balance of when and why am I picking this character? 
but it creates also some very surprising moments where a player is surprised as to the role that you played or a player is frustrated because the role or the character that you played trumps them, beats them to the punch, or just absolutely, you know, disqualifies their turn altogether. It could create some very frustrating but fun moments in a game. Now, another thing that makes this game interesting is that there are goals that kind of diversify all the players. So at the beginning of the game, each player is going to have a hidden goal, a hidden objective that is a secret way for, you know, he or her to score. So if, if they accomplish their goal by the end of the game, at the end of the game, you reveal your, your cards, your mission cards, and then you tally the points based on that as well. So it's not just the area majority. A player might feel like they had the game in the bag because the visible score was to their favor. They were collecting lots of victory tokens from having the majority in their different colonies. But then they're surprised when they see that their opponent collected X amount of points for accomplishing their objective, and then and they did it. Also, there's different hidden events that are slid under the game board around the different sections, the different colonies of the board that at the end of the game, again, are revealed and impact that particular colony in one way or another. It could be for the positive or it could be for the negative, but only the player who drew that event card and placed it under that colony knows whether or not it's good or bad. Again, it's a game that kind of has a game within the game kind of thing or maybe a game outside the game because after you've played the game that reveal phase in and of itself feels almost like another game it's just so much fun and 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 so rewarding to be able to look at your opponent in the eye and say you thought you won but look at this and look at that and look at this no i won um and again you know you just have to tip off tip your hat off to the people who are able to pull it off. It's a, it's a good game. Um, it's a game that uh, has had good success as I've played it. I, I haven't played this game too many times. And it does have a, a very functional two-player variant. But definitely this game is better with three or more players. As again, I mentioned earlier in the video. That's just the case for area control, area majority. For, you know, for the most part. That's the rule of thumb. The more, the merrier. So this game, again, really a game. I don't know where it's going to trend on my list and with further play. Will it go up? Will it go down? Time will tell. But for now, it's my number 32 game of all time, and that's Mission Red Planet. And now we move on to the final game for this list, which is my number 31 game of all time. And this game is the only game in my top 50 that I do not own. First of all, um, I am very, I don't want to use the word obsessive, but when I want a game, I, I, I find a way to get it. I find a way to purchase it. Um, it might take me some time, but I, I'll, I'll get my hands on it. But at the same time, you know, it's not common for a game that I like a lot to not be in my collection because, honestly speaking, I do most of my gaming with friends and family who don't necessarily identify as gamers. The gaming hobby, while it's something that they appreciate, is not something they fully immerse themselves in. So they don't own very much games. And sometimes the games they own are games that I already own too. And sometimes the unique games in their collection are games that I might think are okay, but I'm not very excited about. But this game is an exception, and it's ranked my number 31. All this to finally say what my number 31 game of all time is. My number 31 game of all time is Clank. And for those who know, Clank, Clank is a very highly regarded game. It's very popular. It came out a few years ago, but it's all the buzz. Um, it is a deck-building fantasy game. This, this list actually started with a deck-building fantasy-themed game, and now it's closing with a deck building fantasy themed games, you know, and all these other games sand sandwiched in between. So we've kind of gone full circle in this video. But Clank, kind of like Thunderstone Quest, has a spatial element, but I would say the spatial element is m even more impactful to the game than it is in, um, in Thunderstone Quest. 
this game you are recruiting uh, or, or, or you know acquiring different cards to construct your deck to build your deck and it's interesting because it has three currencies really in the base game you have um, you have attack you have your swords you have your your money that helps you purchase things and you also have your boots which give you the speed to be able to move quicker and more effectively throughout the board, which represents the dragon's lair or the dungeon. Well, it's very challenging to manipulate three different currencies. I've always appreciated games that have deck building games that have two currencies opposed, as opposed to the ones that really just have one. Um, you know, like DC deck building, a game I like, but it's not in my top 50 because it only has really one currency, which is power. But here in in uh, Clan, you have three different currencies and managing them all well is so hard to do. And you want to be able to move through that dungeon and you want to be able to acquire the different artifacts and the different treasures that are going to get you the most victory points and find a way to escape and get out of that dungeon and make it to the top uh, before, to, before your opponents so that hopefully they could get trapped there or at least not... Um, get as many points as you by the end of the game now i will say this this game i've only played it a few times and i've only played this game at two players and it is my impression that this game is not best at two players because what happens is you have these five different treasures or so these five or six different treasures that are worth you know, different amount of points, incrementally speaking. So you got a 25-point treasure and a 20-point treasure and a 15-point treasure and a 10-point treasure and so on and so forth. And you're trying to get the best treasure. And maybe if you grab a backpack, then you're allowed to grab two treasures. But otherwise, you're really just allowed to grab one. Well, if you're playing with two players, chances are the first player to get the higher ranked tokens has a very good chance of winning the game. But if you play with more players, then all of a sudden it becomes harder to be able to get, you know, the victory just because you have the most expensive token. Because so many other things are impacted by the addition of other players in the game. You know, there's only a certain amount of backpacks. Not everybody's going to be able to get them. The player with the highest token might not have a backpack. Um, also, you know... Other players could just start and explore and manipulate all other aspects of the board. I imagine it's more chaotic. There's more people racing for the same thing, I, I imagine, if more players are at it. I would think that playing this game with more people might help this game with me. I'm not too sure. I do kind of see a ceiling in this game for me, so it's hard to predict where it will be next time I do my rankings. But for now, it's ranked number 31. It's a good It's a good fun game and again a weakness for mine deck building games i enjoy deck building games and this is a pretty solid deck building game and it's my number 31 game of all time clank and that's the list for today guys i know it was long i can really really talk that's something i'm i'm pretty good at i don't lack words to share with other people but um, it was fun for me sharing these games. Again, these are games that I'm excited about. And obviously, as I get closer and closer to the top of my list, the more excitement you'll see from me when I talk about these games. But all 10 of these games, including Clank, which I don't own, are just games that have added so many fun experiences to my life. They've created so many opportunities for me to share with loved ones and friends. And that's really what I do this for. I do this because I love connecting with other people and playing with other people and just seeing smiles on people's faces. Sometimes, you know, we might have a bad day. We might have a bad work week. Heck, we might feel like we have a bad life. It's always great to take a break, take a step back from all the stress, take a, a step back from all the terrible things that are happening uh, in, in the real world, all the terrible things that might be happening in your personal life and just sit down with someone who you appreciate their company, someone who you trust, someone who brings smile and laughter to your life and just, you know, bring some smile and laughter to their lives as well. And I feel like games are a great way to do it. But that's enough of that, of that you know, preaching segment there. Um, thank you so much for joining me for this list. Please comment down below as to what you feel about some of these games. It's okay. I, it's okay to disagree. It's okay to 
agree to disagree. It's okay to disagree agreeably. Whatever you want to say, it's fine. Please share your comments. Share maybe some of your personal rankings. Maybe you could share your segment of 40 to 31 in the comments. Please like this video. If you're interested in following the channel and seeing more videos down the line, please subscribe. And I will catch you all next time for my numbers 30 to 21 games of all time. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.